Rra, what's up my people, my name is Spicy and today I have two stories coming out of the subreddit Pro Revenge. If you like these videos, remember to subscribe to the channel and leave a fire emoji in the comments because your engagement does help me grow this channel and make better content for you. Congratulations Granny Winters for the comment of the day. Rra, and that mother-in-law's career after she ruined their lives. I've posted a bit about my fiance's adoptive mother, Susan, in the last couple of weeks mostly on just no meal where i might cross part this to later but for anyone unfamiliar with suzanne she was my lecturer when i was at university suzanne hated that i was dating hated that i was dating her adopted son biological nephew since she found out about us first told her we were dating to kill me via allergy another story for another day and after she found out i was pregnant she stalked us impersonated me and broke into her flat and that's just the tip of the iceberg she made her lives hell to the extent where we no longer felt safe in our own home and my fiance and I had to move across the country to escape her. We've been living in our new place for a little under a week. The baby is due in a couple of months and everything is mostly ready. We have deactivated our social media, created new emails and changed our numbers. Only a few friends and relatives from the town she lives in, which we left, have our new numbers. We had to leave our entire lives and everyone we knew and loved behind while I I was 7 months pregnant because we could not trust her around her baby. Now for the revenge. On Monday, an email was sent from the dean to Susan's graduating students saying Susan was being considered for a promotion, from lecturer to head of department, and they wanted to hear from her students first. The aim of this was to receive glowing recommendations to give to the board. This was not the result. As I changed my email, I had not seen this. One of my friends who had my new number and was on the course with me did see the email. And on Tuesday, he gave my new number to the dean, saying that he would only give her the number in person, on paper, and only if she agreed to ring when she was alone and throw out the paper and erase it from the logs after. If she was calling from a university phone, then the number would go on the call logs that were accessible by all members of staff. But he assured her that this was something she'd want to hear before promoting Susan. So, I got this call from the dean on Tuesday. She told me what was going on. My friend had not had time to get in touch before she rang. And she asked me why my friend thought I should speak to her. I told her everything. I started two years ago, when I met Susan's son, the man who will become my fiancé and the father of my child. I told her about Susan poisoning me via allergy after finding out about me and her son and the EpiPen accident. I told her about the outside of class harassment I received post-pregnancy announcement, impersonating me, crashing GP appointments, breaking in, etc. I told her about the in-class harassment, telling me to break up with my fiancé, stopping lectures until I left, throwing out my food and drink trying to reschedule exams and more. I told her about the last time I saw Susan in person, when she tried to hit me while I was 7 months pregnant with her grandchild. I told her about having to move away. I was careful not to give a location or distance and filing a restraining order to escape Susan. I thought the uni were made aware of the RO but apparently not. Fiance then arrived home from work and when I told him what was happening, he was all too eager to chime in with stuff I forgot. Copying keys, punching the landlord, cancelling orders, going through our things. He also told the dean about the abuse he got from her growing up. We also gave the dean the names of people willing to support our story, as well as some dates, times and locations of on-campus incidents. I had made a note of a few of them, so she could put CCTV from the campus security recordings. Fiancé also told her the story of one of his cousins, Susan's bio kid, who got close with a guy on Susan's course, but the guy was told to break up with her by Susan with a tiny veil threat against his academic career. We also told the dean about Susan telling me to break up with my fiancé and vice versa so she could better maintain professionalism. The dean was horrified. She had me and my fiancé record a video where we said everything all over again from the top. We made sure the video had nothing to identify location and we were assured Susan would never see it. We also sent her all the proof we had alongside it. This was all forwarded to the board on Wednesday and Thursday. She asked my friend for the number again and just called me for the second time, telling me the board unanimously agreed this was great grounds for Susan's dismissal. They said that while the outside of uni events were not really their business, they go towards her character and the fact that as department head, she would represent the department, 
whether she was on the clock or not. They said even without this, the events that happen inside of uni alone, which is stopping lectures and telling me to dump my fiance, telling that older guy to leave her daughters alone, throwing out my stuff, seeking special treatments on grounds of nepotism, were all abuses of power and enough to justify Susan's dismissal. They asked me why I had not filed charges, and I said all I'd gain from filing charges is Susan staying away from me, and the restraining order and moving away has the same effect. Plus, as it is exam season, my tutor work is really taking off, and I don't have the time to go through a whole court case. And I will have even less time once the baby arrives. The baby is due in about 8 weeks, and Susan has already caused me enough stress. Tomorrow, in the meeting where Susan is fully expecting to be told she got her promotion, the dean is now going to give her a week to hand in her resignation. If she refuses, she will be fired. If she does not hand in her resignation, she will be fired. She will not be getting a reference. The only reason she is being given the option to resign is that she has worked at this university for nearly a decade. But if she so much as raises her voice in the meeting tomorrow, she will be fired. Security will be present for the meeting, in case she tries anything. Meanwhile, the friends we left behind are not hesitating to tell anyone who will listen all about what Susan did during the course of mine and my fiancé's relationship. There is not a single soul left in that town who trusts her or will take her side if she tries to fight back. Not even her husband, who told us that now all of their kids are over 18, he will be initiating divorce proceedings. I do not feel even a little bit bad. I know there's a chance I went too far, but I did not lie or embellish anything. I just gave the dean the facts as they are. Everything is 100% true, and while it was me who told the dean, I see this as Susan's action having consequences. Susan has more than enough money to pay for herself for the foreseeable future. Her husband's name is not on the deed, and she bought it before they got married so she would get the house in the divorce as it is not technically a shared asset, or one acquired during their marriage. She would have a roof over her head and money in her bank account, and if she wanted to, she could get another job, just probably not one as a lecturer. Good for her! That's the way to go girl, this is a beautiful and well planned revenge. The woman who made her life terrible and very painful for the past 2 years just got her career destroyed. This soon to be mom taught, hold up, my life is miserable because of this woman and she has no consequences for the evil action she takes against me? Hmm, this does not look right to me, let me mess up this woman's career in a few phone calls. Great job, great revenge, you killed it, I am proud of you. Oh, and by the way, if you like these kind of videos, I've got plenty so you can check them out and I recommend to subscribe if you have not done that already, you would get the best content that I can create. You can be sure I put all of my efforts into this channel so your subscriptions, likes and comments are what shows me that you care and like what I do. Let's go to the next story before I rant for another minute. How to dispose of choosy beggars, the Valtrex edition. When boyfriend and I first moved away from this bad city to this other bad city around 1996 or so, we moved into an apartment building that was really a huge house broken up into 5 or 6 apartments. A few days after moving into the top apartment, we discovered that boyfriend actually kinda knew the couple on the ground floor. As it turned out, boyfriend had graduated with the girl, a blonde with a country, buy me a Seagram's 80s perm. Now, we did not realize this at first, but she was a complete and total Brittany and he was the male counterpart. At first, they seemed nice enough. We hung out a bit and went out a few times to the clubs. I even helped Brittany get on at the place where I work, telemarketing but almost twice what minimum wage was at the time. It was not until we had lived there for a couple of months that we found out rather by abstinence that the couple had a rather extensive opioid habit. I was at work one evening and I had a terrible headache. Brittany came to my desk at break time. We usually went out to eat together and asked me what was wrong. I told her I had a headache and asked her if she had any Tylenol. Well, no, but she had a painkiller. Turns out, she was talking about hydrocodone, and I politely declined it. Over the next few days, she offered me a painkiller for everything, from a tummy ache to being in a bad mood. 
This is when I first started to catch on. As it turns out, Britney and Brian's lives revolves around their pill problems. It was all they talked about. We didn't want to make enemies of people we literally lived on top of. So we subtly started pulling back from the friendship. Eventually, Britney got fired from the job and that's when the choosy begging began. They started out asking to borrow 20 bucks. We did it and they paid us back. No problem. Next thing that happened is that they wanted to share their Kerbal account. Since we were all in the same building, we could run a line and no one will know. Their idea was that we take turns paying each month. Of course, we went first. I did not like this at all. But I figured out that if it went pear shape, we would have a legitimate excuse to get rid of them. The third thing that happened was that Britney came to our door in tears. She said that Brian was downstairs crying. She said that they had no food in the house and that Brian's children were with them for the weekend and they were hungry. We were not exactly domesticated back then, so we had no food to give them. Boyfriend and I are very kind and we were kind of naive back then. So we lent them some money for food. I think it was $50 or so. The next day, Britney is back and she's going on and on about Brian's pill issue. Not hers. No, it was all Brian. Sometime during the conversation, she says that Brian had made her lie to her parents and say they needed food for the children to get money for drugs. Boyfriend and I just looked at each other. We didn't say a word to her, but we were furious. A few days later, our cable was turned off. Since the account was in Britney and Brian's name, we went down to the apartment to find out what was going on. They tried to cover it up at first by making excuses and hemming and howing around, but it did not take long to figure out that the bill had not been paid in over two months. We had given them money for the cable bill that month, but they spent it on something else. Gee, I wonder what. We ended up opening our own account and they actually had the nerve to ask us to share with them. Um, that's a nope for me, dog. They got very pushy about the issue and a few words were exchanged. It was not a pleasant conversation, but we finally had the excuse we needed to cut them off. The problem was that they would not leave us alone. They bad-mouthed us to other people in the building. They stole things from our cars. They called in noise complaints on us and sent the police to beat on our doors, waking us up at 2 and 3 a.m. And there were a few other things too, but that was the final straw. I was just fed up. One night while watching TV, a commercial for Valtrex came on and I got an idea. As it turns out, the first few doses of the anti-herpes medication was free. All we needed was a name and an address to have free information and a voucher for free samples sent to our home. We dialed the number and sat back and waited. Now I know the subscribing people to junk mail or dirty magazines is kind of cliche and we did not really expect anything to come out of it. What we had hoped for at most was a blow up of some sort. We figured that if we were lucky, there would be a fight and some cheating accusations. Maybe if fortune really smiled upon us, they will even break up. What we got was so much worse. It was, in fact, glorious. About 10 days after we made the call, a huge ruckus outside got our attention. Britney was enraged. She was in the yard, screaming at Brian, calling him every name in the book. Brian was standing there watching as she threw his belongings into the yard. Clothes were everywhere. A TV and a lamp smashed on the sidewalk. Britney sat in the middle of it like a blonde banshee in booty shorts, cursing and screaming at the top of her lungs. We were extremely gratified when she asked which of his freaking hoes gave it to him. Eventually, Brian lost patience and the two started brawling in the middle of the street. Beer bottles and gauntlets were thrown. A weave was snatched off. It was a scene fit for the Jerry Springer show. Eventually, the police showed up and Brittany and Brian were driven off in the city's free black and white cab service. They were taking to spend the night in the city's free hotel accommodations, aka the county jail. Apparently, when the police intervened, the couple was found to be in possession of illegal prescription drugs and a night in jail turned into multiple nights in jail. Imagine that. They never returned to the building and we never saw or heard from them again. For all I know, they are still in jail. Oh man, this couple are definitely choosing beggars. Asking to share the cable, then use the cable money to buy pills? They were an addict. They betrayed their friends, people living in their buildings for some pills. 
I know this is sad because addicts will do anything for another dose. And while they are responsible, they are not entirely responsible. It's complicated and messed up, but boy, did they get revenge. They spent multiple nights in jail. But what happened after? We need an update. Did they move after? Were they accused of something more and went to prison? Did they pay back the 50 bucks? I mean, I would want my $50 back. I need the money, okay? Nah, I don't need it, but what I would love to is your support by commenting down below a fire emoji if you think this story was fire. Hey, did you like this pro revenge video? If you did, check out my playlist right here. I bet you will love it. These videos take me a lot of effort to make, so if you can show me some support by liking the video and subscribing, this will mean the world to me. Also hit the bell button to know when we post a new video and join the notification gang. Thank you again for watching this episode of Pro Revenge. See ya!